Today we are going to discuss the notion of synchronization. And in particular, we're going to discuss different kinds of synchronization, going from blocking synchronization to non-blocking synchronization. Let us consider the following example. We have a room with three walls of identical size. And let's suppose we want to paint all this room. And we have three friends. Each of them is equally skilled in uh, painting. And uh, we give a brush to each of these three friends and let them do the work in parallel. And this way, if we want to uh, calculate the speed up, which means that how much faster the three painter would do the work a single one, we would evaluate this as one. Let's say to do the work by one painter would take uh, one hour. And let's say uh, all together they would do it three times faster, 20, 20 minutes, would, this would give a speed up of three. But now let's consider a more complicated scenario in which one of the walls is twice as big as the other two. Now what happens is that when the first two guys finish their walls, the third one is still working. So this way the speed up should be calculated as one, one hour to take the, wor the work by one painter, and then the three-fourth of the work done the tr by th the three painters in parallel, plus one-fourth which should be done sequentially by the remaining painter. So this gives us a speed up of two, even though we have three painters. So altogether, this means that the part which uh, should be done sequentially has some effect on the speed up. This, uh, this observation, known as a folklore Amdahl's theorem, or Amdahl's law, coming after Jean Amdahl, who is one of the prominent computer engineers. When he made this observation, he worked on the uh, first IBM mainframes, and the, uh, the challenge of um, speed up in a multiprocessor program was viable. So he formulated this his principle as follows. So let's uh, suppose that we have a work, and there is a fraction P of this work, which can be parallelized. And let's suppose that we have n processors. So this way, the speed up which we get should be expressed like this. So we have p over n, this is the time to perform the work by n processors in parallel, plus the fraction of the work which cannot be parallelized. And we can see that no matter how many processors we have, the speed up is always bounded by 1 over 1 minus p. So for example, in the, exam in the case of the three walls and one of the wall is twice as big as the, as the remaining two, the speed up would always be bounded by 4, regardless of how many uh, processes we employ for the remaining part of the walls. And this work which cannot be parallelized and that in potentially we should uh, minimize to improve our uh, performance is the part of a work which we read, well, typically uh, formally required to do for synchronization. So what is synchronization and why, would, why do we need syn to synchronize? Okay, so why do we need to synchronize? One of the main reasons is to resolve conflicts when uh, multiple threads of computation, which we call processes, access shared data concurrently. For example, we have a file edited concurrently by multiple users. And uh, the outcome of the concurrent file editing may depend, maybe non-deterministic, maybe non-deterministic, and depend on the schedule of uh, these concurrent accesses. And uh, when the outcome, the result of the uh, computation, in particular the content of the file, depends on the, uh, this non-deterministic scheduling, we call it the rates condition. So synchronization is uh, a problem of resolving races. So there are multiple so-called synchronization problems. One example of a synchronization problem is uh, the problem of mutual exclusion. Intuitively, in mutual exclusion, we have a set of concurrently running processes, and every process runs its own program, and there is a part of its program which may lead to race, to lead to some non-deterministic outcome. And the mutual exclusion problem consists in making sure that these potentially dangerous parts of code are never executed concurrently. These parts of code are called critical sections, and the idea is to make sure that no two processes are concurrently in their critical sections. Another interesting synchronization problem is a problem of readers and writers. In this problem you have a writer which writes a message in the shared memory. Of course it is not able to write the message in one atomic step. And the reader is trying to read the message from the shared memory and of course the, uh, the requirement which we want to impose is that the reader would read a consistent message which means that the message it returns shouldn't consist fragments of different messages written by the writer. And finally an interesting synchronization problem is the problem of producers and consumers. So in this problem we have, in the simplest case, we have two entities, a producer and a consumer, and we have a buffer of a bounded size. So in this particular case it's some maybe shop, which stores items produced by the producer 
and uh, the consumer comes to this uh, buffer to consume the items. So the uh, producer puts the items in the buffer using an operation put, and the consumer gets the items from the buffer using the operation get. And the properties of the problem are the following. First of all, we require that every item is eventually consumed. No item is con consumed twice, which means that if the, uh, producer, if the consumer gets a given item from the uh, buffer, it will never get it again. And of course, the, since the buffer is of bounded size, no more than max items could be in the buffer. So in the absence of concurrency, there is an obvious way to implement it. So one example of this would be to maintain a shared buffer of a given size. So it's just an array of uh, max elements. And also to maintain a shared counter. Essentially, the counter is used just to store the, currently, uh, the current number of items in the buffer. So then, to produce an item, the producer would execute the following code. So first, it would just wait until the size of the buffer, or the number of empty slots in the buffer, would be less than max. Then, once the condition holds, it would store a new item in the buffer using some local variable in, which should later on be incremented module mx, so in is just a circular pointer in the, in, the, in the buffer array. And finally, because since we added one more item in the buffer, we would increment the counter. Well, symmetrically, to consume an item from the buffer, so we would wait until there is something in the buffer, then we would take an element out of it, using some, again, some local variable out. Well, then of course we need to increment the out to keep up with the consumer. Again, module on X. And finally, we decrement the counter because we took one element from it. And uh, you can immediately see that there is, potentially, there is a race. Because uh, both producer and consumer, under some concurrent scenarios, may access concurrently the shared variable counter. So is it really a problem? Let us consider the following scenario. So here, time means the uh, this arrow, so I, I will try to put the atomic events of the uh, execution in this uh, time frame. So let's consider first the behavior uh, of the producer, assuming that the uh, buffer already contains exactly one element. It means that the, the value of the counter is one, and the producer wants to add one more element. What it does first, it tries to update the value of the buffer at position one. So it stores its item there. Then what it does, it tries to check the value of the counter to increment it. So the value of the counter is 1, then it updates the counter. Its new value is now 2. Everything is fine if the execution proceeds sequentially. So now let us assume that uh, concurrently a consumer came and it sees okay, that the uh, value of the counter was initially 1, so there is one item to consume, and it tries to consume this item. What it does, it reads the, the element 0 in the, of the buffer, and stores this locally in some local variable item to return to the application. Okay. Then it tries to decrement the counter. So it uh, reads the value of the counter again and observes that it's still 1. And then let's schedule the update of the counter after the update of the counter performed by the producer. Put it here. And of course it puts it to 0. So what, what does it mean? So intuitively there was one item in the buffer initially. It was consumed by the producer. Oops. What does it mean? means that there was initially one item in the buffer, it was consumed by the consumer, but then there was another item concurrently produced by the producer. So at the end, what we would expect is exactly one item in the buffer not yet consumed. But in reality, what happens is that the value of the counter is zero, and if in the absence of any intervention of, of the producer, the, uh, the consumer would never be able to consume the remaining item from the buffer, violating the property of the problem. So the problem here is namely the race between the update of the counter value by the producer concurrently with the update performed on it by the, by the consumer. Okay, so, so how do we resolve this uh, type of races? Well, the standard way is locking. So the way we uh, serialize all concurrent accesses to the conflicting data, we just protect it with locks. Uh, so in our case, as uh, the Amdahl's principle tells us, we try to minimize the uh, amount of synchronization, and it is apparently sufficient to protect only accesses to the counters. So we, we could simply insert 
some lock and unlock statements before we deal with the counter, respectively for the consumer. And after we're done with uh, dealing with the counter, we unlock the successes. So uh, now what happens is that uh, when the producer is putting an item to the buffer and increments the counter, so it would it would protect this manipulations with the counter with the with the, with the lock, and as a result, the concurrent access of the counter performed by the consumer would have to be shifted shifted either before the uh, manipulations of the counter performed by the consumer or after. In this case, let's assume it goes after. So and now, as you can see, the value of the counter read by the consumer would be 2 and the uh, decrement on the counter would be executed in the correct way so now the value of the counter the resulting value of the counter would be 1 so this, uh, as i said this is because both manipulations of the counter are protected with locks to illustrate the benefits of different synchronization schemes and in particular the benefits of non-blocking synchronization let us consider a, a slightly more interesting example So let us consider a set abstraction that can be manipulated using three operations, add, remove, and contains. So naturally, an add operation simply add an element A to the set, a remove operation takes it from the set and contains, checks if the element A is in the set. So respectively, all of these operations produce uh, a Boolean output. For the add operation, it, is, uh, it returns true if the element was not in the set originally, remove uh, returns true if and only if the element was in the set originally, and contains, of course, but returns true if, if the element is found in the set. Uh, this, one of the standard, way, standard ways to implement uh, a set is uh, to use a sorted linked list. So it's a data structure which stores uh, elements on the list as node, element of the set as uh, nodes in the list. So each node has a next pointer, which points to the next element sorted in the uh, ascending order. And it also has two sentinel nodes, head and tail. Now let's suppose that for the moment the uh, list stores three values. One, let's say, five and seven. So uh, in the sequential setting where no two operations run concurrently, uh, to implement uh, operations on the uh, list is uh, quite straightforward. So every uh, operation would first traverse the list, finding the uh, location where uh, uh, the operation should uh, apply its updates and then uh, modify the next pointers of certain uh, nodes and uh, return the uh, corresponding outcome. For example, if you want to add an element, let's say uh, 3, you first search until you find a, an, a, an odd element with, uh, which is equal or more than 3, in this case it is 5, and then you, you would create a new node which stores value 3, which would point to the next element in the sorted order and then uh, you would simply shift the next pointer of the uh, of not storing one to point it to three. Of course the problem arrives when you have uh, concurrency. Of course if, if uh, there is a concurrent operation trying to modify uh, the same node you may uh, get a problem. For example if I want to insert an element two concurrently and both of them would realize that uh, uh, concurrently would uh, traverse the list and find that uh, it is the node storing one which should be modified. Then the concurrent modification would simply remove the pointer from one and point it to the node storing to two. In this way, the update of operation add three would be lost in favor of operation add two. And this is something which we do not want to tolerate. To tolerate. If the operation has succeeded, the element which uh, you add to the list should be there. So, uh, well, intuitively, how we avoid this kind of races, all the standard way is again to lock the data structure. And the, uh, the, what uh, the coarse grain locking approach would tell us is to lock the whole data, data structure. So this is what we call coarse grained locking. And this is very easy to understand, very easy to program, but of course it has its uh, drawbacks, and in particular it, it uh, excludes all kinds of concurrency among operations. So all operations should be serialized, and in particular if you run uh, your uh, program on a multi-core computer, you don't benefit at all from having multiple cores. So instead, you might think of uh, a more sophisticated scheme based on uh, fine-grained locking of elements of the, of the list.